I'm starting with or without you. So welcome to system level programming, SIS 220. Who am I? So I'm Dr. Burton Ma. My office is in uh, good one 754. Office hours I don't have posted yet. They'll be posted on on queue shortly. Uh, the best way to contact me is via email. Uh, actually, the best way to contact me is in office hours. However, if you can't make office hours, you can try emailing me. Uh, when you email me, make sure to include SIS220 in the subject line so I know who you are. Right? Otherwise, I have to search through all of the courses that I teach to find out who you are. Uh, and that's infuriating. Uh, that's my email address there. Um, uh, that's the preferred one that, that you should use to contact me. Uh, teaching assistants, there are some teaching assistants for this course. Uh, they're supposed to have office hours, but they're not set up yet. Uh, so as soon as the TA sign their contracts and we get everything sorted out, uh, that information will be posted on OnQ. So the teaching assistant office hours will probably be virtual, so on Teams. Uh, all their course information that you need to know about, you can find on OnQ as of, I think, two days ago. Lectures will be recorded and posted. Okay, textbooks. Um, the textbooks. Okay, so there's no textbook that you have to buy for the course. There's a set of Jupyter notebooks this year uh, for the course. So if you took SIS 124 with me and you used uh, the Jupyter notebooks for Java, there are now similar notebooks for Bash and C. Uh, there are a set of course notes written by Dr. David Lamb that you can access for free via that link there. Um, those notes are very terse. So they're not, uh, they're difficult to learn from. There's no examples or anything. It's basically, here's some information. Uh, if you do want reference books, the library has literally hundreds of excellent books. Two of them that I recommend are here. You hit those links, you have access to those uh, online. Uh, you can also buy printed versions of those if you want. Just go to Amazon or whatever, Indigo, wherever you want, uh, and uh, you can purchase these books. And there's many, many, many more that you can use as references. Furthermore, uh, the content of this course, everything is, you can easily find online if you search for it. The official bash manual is online. The language definition for the C language is online. Everything's online. Right? Um, search Stack Overflow for pretty much any question you could ever ask, right? There's probably an answer for it. Might not be the right answer, but there's an answer for it. Uh, grading, well, let's go to OnQ. All right, so uh, when you go to OnQ, if you go to Course Description and Requirements, uh, Course Description, that's basically the calendar description and a link to the Computing Science Common Syllabus. Textbook tells you what I just told you. Grading Scheme gives you the grading scheme. Um, this is probably the final grading scheme. There might be one fewer assignment. So there might be five instead of six, but I'm planning for six. 45% uh, of your uh, weight is in, the first, is in the assignments. There are two tests in class. The dates have been scheduled, so these are the dates. I think there are Wednesdays, um, if I remember correctly. Uh, and there is an exam, uh, which is set by the registrar, right? Sorry, it's set by the exam office here. Um, many computing science courses, you have to get X percent on a test or exam to have your assignments count. I don't do that. That's your grading scheme, okay? Any questions so far? All right. Assignments, um, similar to 124, right? You do them individually, assignment solutions get posted, hopefully three days after the assignment due date. It could be a week, depending on how many people get sick and so on and so forth this term. Uh, the late submission policy is assuming it's three days, assuming I'm posting the answers three days after the uh, d due date. Uh, late submission policy is uh, nothing accepted after three days, including if you have an academic accommodation. Right? If you have an academic accommodation that requires more time than three days, you have to contact me and arrange for something else. Right? Uh, but the goal is to post the assignment solutions quickly so that people can uh, access the solutions um, and see uh, and use those uh, to learn from. Right? There's a small penalty applied to your overall grade if you hand in something late. Um, but you should, uh, I mean, it's not the end of the world. Right? Quizzes, well, all right, so the quizzes are in class, the dates are on OnCue, exam, in person, scheduled by the exam office. Okay, 
So what's this course all about? It's uh, called system level programming. Um, basically, I mean, there's a calendar description. Uh, but basically, you're going to learn about an operating system called Linux, right? In that operating system, you're going to use something called the Bash shell, right? Bash uh, is also a programming language, so you're gonna write some Bash scripts. Uh, and then we're gonna program in C, right? So roughly five weeks of Bash, roughly seven weeks of C, um, roughly thereabouts. Okay, so in your first few programming courses, so CISC 121 and CISC 124, um, you did a lot of high level programming, right? So you used a program, uh, you used uh, Python and Java to create um, relatively simple programs, right? Uh, in this course, we uh, go down a level, um, I guess, we go down to a lower level, right? So in Python and Java, those languages actually do a lot for the programmer. Right? In Python or Java, you call print or println and something gets printed to the screen. Right? Uh, you're going to find that when you start programming in C, that's no longer the case. Right? Um, in Python and Java, if you try to use a list or an array, right, and you try to get an element that's out of bounds, you get an error. Right? In C, you don't. Right? So we're going down to a lower level of programming in this course. Uh, the language that you learn, they have their roots in the 1970s. Right. So Bash, uh, I guess, actually, the predecessor of Bash was uh, Born. The predecessor of Born is SH. Um, those all came back, those all started in the very early days of computing. Right. C is also from the 70s. Right. Uh, both of these things are still very widely used now. Right. So C and the C-like languages, C++ and C-sharp, probably, if you, gather, if you look at those as a group, are probably the most common uh, family of languages in use today. Why not Python or Java? Because C is a lot faster than Python and Java, right? No one's programming their AAA video games in Python or Java, right? Uh, they're all in C or C++ or C sharp. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start playing around in an operating system called Linux, right? So what's an operating system? Um, most of you, you know, you just use Mac or Windows. Um, you know that Mac or Windows, you might know that it's an operating system, right? You interact through, uh, with it mostly through the uh, mouse, right? So you point and click at things. If you're using a um, word editor or something like that, you're of course typing, right? What does the operating system actually do, right? So that's your operating system in blue. Your operating system sits on top of your hardware, right? So your CPU, your disk drive, right? Your network adapter, your sound card, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Your operating system is the thing that talks to your hardware. Right? Now, if you're using a piece of software, that piece of software sits on top of the operating system. Right? So your program, any program that you write or might be using, like PowerPoint or Word, right, that's actually talking to the operating system to do things. Right? So when you save a file in Word or PowerPoint or whatever it is you're using, right, uh, your program asks the operating system to save the file. The operating system talks to your hard drive right, and actually saves all the bits and bytes of your, of your file, right? So we're starting to move into the operating system level, right? You're not gonna quite get there. We're, mo we're still in the application level, right? So we're still writing bash scripts and we're still writing C programs, right? But you're gonna start to see some aspects of dealing with the operating system itself. Okay, most of you, um, unless you've used Linux at all, right, uh, you've probably, you're, experience with working with computers is probably strictly through a graphical user interface, right? Mouse, pretty icons, things like that, right? Point and click, occasionally type, right? Uh, now there's an alternate form of interaction with the computer, which used to be the only way of interacting with the computer, right? And that's via what's called a command line, right? So in other words, uh, you basically type uh, into a screen, right? Um, not so long ago, when you used a computer, all you would see is a black screen and text. Right, so that's actually how I learned to program uh, when I was in high school, right? That's all you'd see. Um, and now you've got um, all sorts of pretty graphics and all sorts of other things, right? Um, but the way you interact with the computer is strictly through the console, right? So a lot of this course actually gets you working at the command line to interact with the operating system. You know, a lot of the tasks that you'll be doing are strictly through the command line. Okay. The operating system we're using is called Linux. It's more properly called GNU Linux. Um, if you want to, if you hit that link, uh, you can read a little bit about the history of Linux and what Linux actually is, right? But in brief, right, it's a free 
open source operating system. Right? Uh, the fact that it's free and open source uh, has made it very successful. Right? Uh, so it's widely used. In fact, it's almost universally used on a lot of uh, computing infrastructure. So things like servers and mainframes and supercomputers, right, the stuff that drives the internet, right, the stuff that makes Amazon and Netflix and Google possible, most of that is uh, running on Linux servers. And not all of it, but most of it is. Right? Uh, and there are no Apple servers whatsoever. Right? It's, either, it's either Linux or Windows. Uh, Linux is also very popular on embedded devices. So these are things that don't, ordinar that don't look like a regular computer. Right? Uh, so like a clock or a, uh, your network router or something like that. Right? All of these small devices, a lot of them will run uh, either a custom operating system or Linux of some form. Right? The fact that Linux is free is actually one of the big reasons why it has become successful. Right? No one calls it GNU Linux, everybody calls it Linux. Right? So I'm just gonna call it Linux from now on. Now, if you have to use Linux, that's a bit of a problem because none of your computers, almost none of your computers, are probably running Linux. Is anybody actually using Linux on a desktop? Okay, so there's a few of you, right? Um, everybody else, you're probably Windows or Mac, right? And probably half and half or thereabouts, I'm guessing. Right, now, that's a bit of a problem because you need access to Linux, right? So how are you gonna do that? Uh, so number one, everybody has access to Cast Lab. There's a lot of you. There's no way you're all gonna fit in Cast Lab, right? But if you want to, you can go into Cast Lab and sit down at a computer that's running Linux. Uh, they run some sort of version of Ubuntu, I believe, in there. So, if you don't want to mess around on your home computer, or if your home computer is busted or something like that, you can always go into Cash Lab and do the work for this course. Right? Uh, you need to sign up for an account and things like that. Follow that link, um, and that'll tell you what to do. Right? If you have problems getting access to your Cash Lab account, go talk to uh, the tech people in the course. Right? I, I don't. I'm not the administra uh, administrator for uh, Cash Lab. Right. If you have issues with Cast Lab, you have to go talk to the system administrators in the department. Right. Okay. Okay. Now, if you're using Mac, uh, fortunately, Mac OS is close enough for our purposes. Right. Um, and I'll show you. I'll take you to the OnQ page in a second. If you're using Windows, uh, that's a little more complicated, but still doable. Right. So if you um, look at OnQ, oops, sorry. Not here, okay. So if you go to OnQ under content, you should see somewhere, course three, here? Yeah, there's a getting started link. Hit the getting started link, right, and it tells you, sorry, let me make this a little bigger for you. Right, so here, there's a little bit of description of saying what you have to do. Apple, or Mac OS, you have to install some software, but that's the extent of it. Windows, you have to install more software, uh, but again, that's the extent of it. If you're a Windows user, you've got two choices. Um, you can either use a virtual machine, right? So install a VMware, what the heck are they called? VMware workstation, right? So that's a virtual machine emulator, right? I have a virtual machine, I have a Linux virtual machine image that you can load into that program, and you will get a fully functioning Linux environment like this, which is running on my crappy laptop, right? I'm actually running Windows, and on top of Windows, I'm running a full-fledged Linux environment. Right, uh, there we go, right, and so there you go. So uh, this is probably the recommended, well, is it the recommended way? I don't know if this is the recommended way to do this. If you want to learn about Linux, this is the recommended way to do this. If you just want to get through this course, you might want to do the other thing instead. Um, so the other thing that you can do is to go back, right? So if you're a Mac user, uh, just go to, what is this? Go to, oh, it's because I changed the font, sorry. Never mind. There. Uh, so if you're a Mac user, go to that link there. I tell you how to install all the software that you need for the course, right? So, oh, there's a link right here. I don't know if it's gonna work, or something's going on with the Queen's network. Okay, right, so there's a page here, takes you through all the software that you need to install, um, and that will tell you how to get all the software you need to get your Mac working for this course. Uh, it also tells you how to get the notes for this course. Windows, if you want a virtual machine, uh, click on that link there. 
right? Otherwise, you can you install what's called the Windows subsystem for Linux. Uh, and this works a lot better than I thought it would two weeks ago, right? Uh, so if you want to install the Windows subsystem for Linux, you don't have to install a virtual machine. The advantage of this is that the, the disadvantage of the virtual machine is that it's like a 10 gigabyte download. Um, so if you're trying to do it today, for example, that would really suck, especially if you're on the Queens network. Um, so it's a large download that you, have to, uh, that you have to do. Now, once you've got it downloaded and working, everything's installed for you. So that's all you have to do. Yeah? So everyone has to be on the same computer, right? No. You can use whatever distro you want. Um, right. So if you want to use the Windows subsystem, that just involves installing software from Microsoft and some other places, basically. Uh, there are instructions for both. Uh, surprising. So what surprised me is that you can just install the Windows subsystem for Linux and actually get Jupyter note, uh, the Jupyter Notebooks running, um, which I didn't think you'd be able to do, but you can. So you can actually have a Jupyter Notebook on Windows that runs Bash and C um, via your Linux subsystem, um, which kind of surprised me. All right, so those are your choices, right? So lots of choices for you. Uh, I guess there's even more choices if you're a Windows user. You can install Linux if you want. Uh, you can get a USB stick and install a live version of Linux and do it that way. Um, so there's lots of options for you. Right? I've tried to make it as easy as possible for you. Um, so follow the instructions. When you do so, follow them carefully because you have to type in a lot of stuff and you have to type it in accurately, otherwise something won't work. Right? Uh, but it is possible to get everything set up on your home computer and do everything from your home computer. Um, all right, so um, I guess I'm just going to show you the uh, Jupyter Notebook. So everything that I do here, you can do from a command line directly in Linux, or you can do it from within a notebook, right? So in other words, I can type into this console here and get something to happen. Most of the time, I'm just going to run it in the note. Is this the right one? Uh, sorry. Most of the time, I'm just going to run it in the notebook for you. So did I close it? Oh, no, I didn't. All right. So you, uh, the notebooks, uh, you basically download a zip file. If you download the virtual machine, the notebooks are installed for you. Uh, if you're using Windows subsystem for Linux, you download a zip file, extract the zip file into your Linux distribution, and you get the notebooks. Right. Uh, the notebooks, do, do, do. so this is the starting page here. Right. OK. Uh, so the notebooks are not complete. They're not all here yet. So the bash ones are all here. The C ones are not all here yet for you, right? Uh, but if you start at the top here, oh, come on, sorry. This is a lot easier to use with a mouse, right? Uh, I've got all the Unix and bash. So this stuff here, you can just read in your own time. Uh, the command line, so this is where I'm going to start today, right? So if you pop open that notebook. Uh, so this is a Jupyter notebook that knows about bash. Please give it a second to start up. There you go. Okay. So if you use the CISC 124 notebooks, uh, these are basically the same, right? The 124 notebooks, they use Java. The uh, 220 notebooks are all Bash and uh, C. Right? And so these are the official source of the notes for the course. And these are also the official source of the lecture material for the course. Uh, so most of the lectures aren't going to have a lot of PowerPoint. Most of the time, I'm just going to be spent on the command line or in a notebook showing you how to do stuff. Right? So uh, Bash, the, this thing called Bash is what's called a shell. I'm going to explain to you what a shell is later on. Right? Um, you can think of it as just a program. Right? You type stuff into it. Right? So you type in commands. The shell interprets the commands and tries to do something with the command. Right? So it's a, an example of a command line interface. Uh, now, one of the problems with learning uh, something like Bash or Linux right, is that there's a lot of commands. So on the computer, on, on my virtual machine, there's something like 4,500 commands uh, that you can run from a shell directly. Right? Does anybody actually know what all 4,500 commands do? The answer is no. Right? And no one's going to expect you to know what all 4,500 commands do either. Right? But there's a lot of them. Uh, so that's one of, the, uh, that's one of the, I guess, difficulties in learning uh, how to uh, run from a command, how to, use, uh, how to use a command line interface. 
Right? So a lot of this course is spent teaching you about these commands and how to use them. So in this notebook, I'm just going to show you some examples of running some commands. Right? Okay, so when you get the notebook, just like last year, right, whenever you see a gray cell, uh, that's a cell that you can run. Right? So that's a bash command right there. Right? So echo and then hello world in quotes. Right? If you, oh, sorry, hang on. I need to do this and then do this. Okay, so if I run that cell, right, it just spits out hello world, right? So echo is sort of like the print in Python, right, or print line in Java, right? It prints something followed by a new line, I believe. Right? So that's how you print something to the screen. Right? Uh, so this command called ls, right, uh, this lists the contents of a directory. Now, most of you probably know, most of you probably call directories folders. Right, so this basically lists all the files in a folder. Right? So in Bash, there's this, oops, sorry. In Bash, there's this notion of a current working directory. So that's just the folder that the Bash shell is currently in. Right? Uh, let me inst insert another command instead. So here. Right, so I'm gonna insert a cell. I'm gonna put in the command pwd. Right? So pwd is print working direct, sorry is print working directory. So if I run that, that tells me what directory is this shell currently running in, right? So it's in this directory, home, sys220, big C, sys220, uh, sys220 fall bash, right? Uh, and so that's the folder. If you were to go into your operating system, right? So if I was to go into, oops, into my file browser here, uh, which I cannot easily make any bigger, sorry, right? So if I go to, uh, sorry, home, right, sys220, sys220 fall, bash, right, you'll find a bunch of files here, and one of those files is the notebook that you're looking at. So this is the current directory that my shell is in, in the Jupyter notebook. Sorry, this is really hard to do without a mouse. Uh, Okay, ls. So ls will list the contents of the directory, right? So just like your file manager will give you a graphical display of the files in a folder, ls will list the contents of a file in a folder. Right, so if I run that, lo and behold, you get the uh, contents of the folder. Right, and you see there's a, well, there's a few files in here, right, a, few, a couple dozen files. Right, all of these things called .ipynb, those are all of your notebook files. Uh, if you go into the scripts folder, those are where the bash scripts are kept. Right. Okay, so if we look inside this folder, come on, right? There's this file called animals.txt. If I want to, right, I can look at the contents of that file with this command called cat, right? So cat concatenates files and prints the result to uh, the terminal, right? So if you have a text file, you can cat the text file and it will print the contents of the file to the terminal, right? And you see that the file contains the contents cat, zebra, dog, or armadillo, right? So not the most exciting file in the world. Right, similarly, there's a file called fruit.txt. I can cat that. Oh, there is no fruit.txt, look at that. Uh, so I guess I have to make fruit.txt. There's supposed to be a fruit, <coughs> anyway. Um, So give me a second here while I make a file called fruit.txt. Is it really not here? Uh, oh, I see. My bad. There is a file here called fruits.txt. It's fruits.txt. Right. So just like in 124, the notebooks you can edit the notebooks and uh, at your uh, to your desire. Right. Edit this. No edit the notebook cells. Look at the results, right? You can run them. You don't have to worry about compiling or anything like that, right? Everything runs from within the notebook, right? So if I cat that, you see that there's a bunch of fruit, right? I can cat two files at the same time, right? Now remember, cat is actually short for concatenate, so it will join the contents of the two file and print the result, right? So if I run that, you get all of the animals and the fruit. Right? Okay, so what else can you do? Well, there's this command called sort. Right, sort will read a file and sort the contents. 
So if I run that, if I run that, right, you end up with the animals, but now they're in sorted order. Right? So they're sorted as strings. And you can now combine commands together. Right? So uh, the way things work in unit, well, Linux, is uh, there are commands that do, commands are supposed to do a well-defined thing. And the commands are supposed to do those, um, they're supposed to be, they're supposed to do those things well. Right? So cat knows how to concatenate files. Right? If you want to do something else, right, the way things work in uh, Linux is that you take the result of a command and you send it to another command. Right? So I can use this vertical bar to take the result of cat and send that to the sort command. Right? Sort will take the output of cat and sort the result. Right? So if I run that, right, you end up with all of the animals in fruit, this time in sorted order. Right? So now they're all mixed up, but they're in sorted alphabetic order. All right, so still not the most exciting thing in the world. Right? There's a command called grep. So grep will look in a file for a pattern. Right? So you specify the pattern with something called a regular expression. Grep will look through the file and it'll tell you, does that file contain that pattern? Yes? Uh, no, it's all left to right. It's all left yeah, okay. unless there's an operator somewhere in the command, uh, which I'll tell you about later, and then the operators have precedence. But uh, there's only like there's only four operators, so basically everything's left to right, um, except when it's not. <laughs> but <laughs> that's just the way Bash works. Uh, normally, it's left to right. Okay, uh, grep will search a file or files for a pattern or patterns, right? So that funny statement here will search for all animals that start with the letter A. Right? So if I look in that file called animals.txt, there's a few animals. Only one of them starts with the letter A. Right? If I look in that file called fruits.txt and I want to find all the fruits that have the letter P, well, I can do that too. Right? I just grep for the letter P uh, and that will find me all fruits. That will find me all fruits that have the letter P in them. The date command prints the current date and time. Right? This was useful back in the day when all you were looking at was a console. Right? So when all you had to look at was one of these things here. Right? So that's basically that's a terminal. Right? This is what your this is basically the user interface you used to be provided with um, quite a long time ago now. Right? If you wanted to know what the time was, you'd either look at your watch or you'd type in date. Right? So if I, sorry, if I type in date correctly, it will actually print out the date. I know you can't read that, but uh, it did print out the date. Right? So the date command will print out the date and time. Right? Now, a lot of these commands uh, have what are called options or switches. Right? So date doesn't just print out the date, you can ask the date for parts of the date, right? So most commands have some sort of option to modify the behavior of the command. This is the other problem with using or learning how to use uh, the command line, right? There's lots of commands. Almost all the commands have options. So you have to learn the options for the commands, right? I'll show you how to access the documentation for all of this, um, probably in a lecture or two, right? Uh, for the date command, if I just wanna get the date, right? I can ask it for just the date. If you're on Mac, I think the command is slightly different. The date command on Mac is uh, different than the date command on Bash. Okay. Uh, now, what if you want to? Yep. Sorry, uh, can you go back to the for a second? Can I go back to? Like, uh, date, uh, yep. So, with the hyphen. Yep. Uh, are you specifying something, or are you removing something called like hyphen? No. So that's a good question. Oh, sorry. I have to bring a mouse next time, sorry. Okay, so on the command line when you run, oh, sorry, when you run a command and there's a hyphen something, that hyphen something indicates that you're uh, trying to use an option for the command, right? So hyphen I means use the, whatever the I um, 
uh, whatever the I option is for the date command. Right? There's a manual that you can look up for what all the options do. Right? So I'm not removing anything. I'm actually telling date what I want printed out. Yeah. Okay. Cal prints out a calendar. Right? Again, not so useful. Oh, I haven't installed it yet. Uh, Cal would, Cal would print out a calendar if I had installed the program. That's funny. Okay, so uh, I'll have to fix that. Um, so that prints out a calendar. Again, not so useful in today's world, right? But back in the day when all you're staring at was a black screen and you wanted to know what the day of the month was, this program was awful useful. Right? I'm just going to skip over the Cal examples then uh, for the time being. Okay. Now, this is where the stupid stuff starts. All right, so there's a command called fortune. Fortune prints out a random, uh, well, fortune, right? So if I run the fortune command, I get this, right? You display the wonderful traits of charm and courtesy, right? If you run it again, so just go back to the cell, run it again, you get a different fortune, right? It's all in the mind you know, uh, and so on, and so on, and so on, right? Basically, it's reading some database of uh, lines of text um, that the program knows about, and it's just picking one at random. Right, today is the first day of the rest of the mess. Yes, that's exactly right. This is the first day of the rest of Six Two Twenty. 20. Right. Okay, so fortune's just a command. It prints something out to the screen. I can take that output, send it somewhere else. Right. So there's this program called CalSay. Let me show you what CalSay does. Uh, CalSay. <laughs> print something to the screen using a cow, right? Uh, and there's various options that you can use to change uh, what the cow looks like, right? So you can make it tired, you can make it, I forget, there's a few things. You can change the way the eyes look. Uh, you can change the animal that's used to print, right? Uh, and so on and so on and so forth, right? So it has a bunch of options as well. Yes, someone spent their time writing this program, right? So. Uh, you'll find that a lot. There are people, you'll find all sorts of silly little programs uh, that programmers have spent time writing. Right? Uh, fortune, I can take the fortune and I can output that to cow say, and then the cow will say the fortune. So he was part of my dream, of course, but then I was part of his dream too. Right? Um, and so on and so on and so forth. Right? So you can run it again and you'll get a different fortune. Right? I can even take what cow say does and send it back to cow say again. So I can have a cow, oops, sorry, say a fortune said by another cow, right? And so on and so on, yeah? What's the hyphen n doing? Hyphen n there, that's a good question. Uh, so let me, let me take the hyphen n off. So this is a good question, right? So whenever you have a question, right, and you're working in the notebook, just go to the notebook cell and delete the hyphen n and see what happens, right? So delete the hyphen n, rerun it. You're probably gonna get a mess. Oh, this one's not so bad. Oh, yes it is, okay, so there it is. So when you get the cow, it's all messed up, right? And so if you actually look at the documentation for what hyphen n does, uh, it says that it does not do any line breaking. Otherwise, if the hyphen n is, so hyphen n is not there, uh, the cow say program breaks lines at 40 characters. Right? So in this output, so uh, if, your, if your output is more than 40 characters, which it is when you use the cow say program, Right, then you get this mess. Right? If you use minus n, CalSay doesn't do the line breaking. It just prints things out the way, uh, it just prints things out the way uh, it normally appears. Right? Okay, uh, and then the toilet command is another silly program. Uh, let me show below. Uh, sorry, insert. So toilet's one of these programs where if you give it a string, it will print the string, but it's going to use big fonts to do this, to print it out. Oh, sorry. Run. Right? So it, it prints it out using like a, sort of like a banner. Right? So you can do the same thing. You can take the output of fortune, send it to toilet, and toilet prints out a banner, uh, which I can't read at all on here. Sorry. I, I don't know what that's saying. Yeah, I can't read that. It, it looks a lot better when you're on the console. Yeah? Uh, that's a good question. Um, where did I, somewhere, somewhere I told you where it was. Uh, there's a notebook that actually tells you what it is. 
it's um, the first three letters are the initials of someone's name. Uh, so the TOI, they're the initials of three people's names, the three programmers who wrote the program. LAT is letters. Um, so there's another program called Figlet. So Figlet, again, F-I-G, those are the name of the three programmers, and then let is letters. So it does some, something similar. It prints out letters in a big font. So toilet is the TOI. What is TOI? Is it their name or something else? I can't remember. Oh, there you go. It's the other, yes. So it's the other something. The other implementation of letters, right? Where the other implementation is figlet. Right, that's all. There's a whole bunch of these stupid little Linux commands, right, that you can download and install on your computer. Right? Uh, it goes on and on and on and on, right? If you do a search for like uh, 20 fun Linux commands or something like that, you'll find all sorts of things. You can play Pac-Man in your terminal. Uh, you can do like Space Invaders. You can do um, the Matrix. Is this supposed to be installed on here? See, Matrix. Oh no, this won't, run, this won't work in here. Uh, not everything works in a Jupyter notebook, so often you have to pop open a terminal to actually get something done. Uh, I don't remember if it's installed. Oh, it is installed. So there you go. So someone spent time writing this, right? This is the, uh, the matrix. This is the, um, the screen that was in the matrix, right? Um, and so on and so forth. There's a whole bunch of these commands, right? Um, actually, implementing these commands um, is a good learning experience. Uh, it turns out a lot of these things are actually very hard to do. Sorry, someone had their hand up? Yeah. Yep. Lines, yep. The That's exactly right. Yes. Um, what's step one? Is the order matters? The order matters. Yes. If I flip these around, you would uh, you would take the output of toilet and send it to fortune. Okay. Now, fortune doesn't take any input, so you're probably gonna end, you'll probably end up with an error. I think. I'm not actually sure, but again, you can try it. Right? You just bloop, see what happens. What's that thing called? The bar. Yeah. It's a pipe. Okay. Yeah. You'll learn about. So there's a notebook on that. Right? So if you go to start here, right, somewhere, there's a notebook that tells you all about it. Right? The notebooks for Bash are all done. If you want to go away for like the next five weeks and just read the notebooks and play around in them, be my guest. Right? Um, so that would be a perfectly acceptable way of learning the material in this course. All right. Uh, that's all I'm going to talk about today, I think. Um, we'll pick things up in our next lecture. Um, in the meantime, try to get your home computer set up so that you can actually run these examples on your home computer.